So I want to thank you for joining us for our lecture series today. This is actually the last lecture of our series for this quarter, or for this um, year, academic year. We'll be starting up again in the fall, um, and at some point we'll be announcing our speakers for next year. So I could say we saved the best for last, if you want. <laughs> or at least the most presenters. Or the most presenters for last. There we go. Um, but I'm really delighted to introduce to you all today a, a panel of uh, speakers, many of whom are colleagues of mine at the University of Washington. And I'll just run through who folks are and then talk a little bit about what you're going to say. And then at the end, um, we'll have time for questions. And you're, are you guys OK with them asking questions throughout as well? Or? Oh, yes, okay. please. We'll also so, try to be done by 120 for 10 minutes. 10 minutes for discussion. That's great. So to my immediate right is Dr. Aaron Lyon. He is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor. I don't know why I'm reading this. I totally know it. <laughs> the University of Washington. From memory, too. From memory. I know, right. <laughs> He's in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and also over at Seattle Children's. And we have Eric Bruns, who is also a clinical psychologist, associate professor in the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy, which is housed within the Division of Public uh, um, excuse me, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. I thought I got that after like six years, and then I just stumbled That's why I have to read the I know. <laughs> um, and then also who are going to be up here is Christy Ludwig, who's also a licensed psychologist and faculty at the School of Medicine, and Elizabeth McCauley, who I think stepped out for just a second, but she'll also be presenting today. She is professor and director of the Psychology Internship Program at Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and is over at Seattle Children's Hospital. They're going to be talking to us today actually about I'm really excited to hear this presentation because it's about their new center. It's called the SMART Center, um, which stands for University of Washington School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training. That was very convenient that that turned out in an acronym. Um, and this is about research and quality improvement activities. Um, and they focus on contextually appropriate quality improvement in education sector, mental health and behavioral health an ongoing project to develop and test a brief stepped care intervention called BRISC, the Brief Intervention for School Clinicians, will be highlighted. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sue. Um, so I'm Aaron Lyon, and uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what the, the SMART Center is and sort of how the, the SMART Center came to be, and then I'm going to pass it over to Eric um, to provide a little more background on, on our talk. Um, but the SMART Center is a collaboration between some of us in the School of Medicine and our colleagues in the College of Education. And I think it's actually unique as school mental health centers go in that it's duly located across both of those colleges, um, which is really intentional and something that we're trying to uh, leverage as much as possible um, as we work to integrate mental behavioral health services and education. And we have a lot of projects focused on the use of educational data in addition to behavioral health data um, in combination for um, to support mental health and, and educational programming. Now, the SMART Center, uh, I think, was officially launched uh, in December of 2013. Um, but it really grew out of a collaboration that was strengthened by the BRISC project, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're highlighting that project today, um, and also because it has a lot of uh, interesting content that we, uh, we are always really excited to share. Um, so the SMART Center, the core faculty of the SMART Center include myself and Doug Cheney in the College of Education, um, Elizabeth and in the School of Medicine, Eric in the School in the School of Medicine, Mike Pullman also in the School of Medicine, Clay Cook in the College of Education, um, and Mylene, du Mylene Duong uh, in the School of Medicine. And we have many additional collaborators, including um, really someone who has taken such leadership in the BRISC project, and we'll be telling you all about that today, Christy Ludwig. Um, there are, we have a number of different funding sources that I won't bore you with, um, but I think part of the, the SMART Center and part of what we've been trying to do is um, pull together resources from uh, a lot of different sources relevant to health and to education. And I'm going to pass it over to Eric to give a little background on school mental health and some of the objectives of the center. Absolutely. So is this thing on? I think so. Um, so I'm Eric Bruns uh, in the School of Medicine in the Division of Public Behavioral Health with Sue, Josh, Terry, and some others who are in this room. Um, so in, when you say that you're a mental health services recipient, 
researcher, it always helps to uh, have a little elevator speech to explain to people what exactly that means that you do, right? So my version is to say that um, I focus primarily on two things. One is care coordination for youth with the most serious and complex needs, because that's where about 50 to 60 percent of all of our behavioral health service dollars go, is to the four or five percent of kids with the most serious and complex needs, for whom coordination across systems might be needed to improve their outcomes and keep them in their homes and communities. But the other thing is school mental health. And that's because um, if uh, the most the kids with the most complex needs are where all of, all of our money goes, a lot of our money goes, it's schools where we actually deliver mental health. About 70% of all mental health service encounters take place in the schools. So this is where the kids are, and this is where we have the opportunity to intervene early to help give kids protective factors that might buffer them against risk factors that they might have at home and, and in the community and so forth. Um, another reason that I really focus on school mental health is that um, I am a failed school mental health clinician. So 20 years ago, as part of my clinical internship at the University of Vermont, uh, they sent me to a place called Milton Middle School in uh, very rural uh, northern Vermont. And uh, as a second year graduate student, they essentially showed me what looked like a broom closet, because it was. And uh, teachers started essentially tossing kids into there and saying things like, uh, you deal with them. And uh, this was, uh, so I, needless to say, I did not feel very equipped with competence to address the needs of these kids, because I was just beginning uh, my um, uh, clinical training. But also, I was completely disconnected from the context of the school. I was there about four or five hours a week, didn't know any of the teachers, didn't know what the other resources were in the school, what the, cons what the framework was for supporting student social emotional needs in the school. And so this is one of the reasons that it's so good to be part of the SMART Center and to be really ramping up um, more and more work researching school mental health services is that um, we can look at this in, 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 in one way, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is what's the role of schools in meeting the mental health needs of kids, which certainly is one way of looking at the um, our mission at the SMART Center. But that's kind of through the lens of uh, research psychologists. If you talk to educators or the people who are actually charged with meeting the needs of these, the academic needs of these kids, it's, a, it's the flip side. What's the role of mental health in schools? We have to look at both of these things, and as Aaron's already kind of summed up, the neat thing about our collaboration with the College of Education is that we've got folks coming at it from both points of view. How is it that schools and intervening in schools at multiple levels of support can help the behavioral and emotional status of all of our kids in our society. But then it's very important also to recognize that supporting social emotional learning in kids is going to help schools achieve their mission, which is to uh, help kids learn and succeed academically. So what we're going to do is just, I'm going to quickly give that a little bit of that context of both of those uh, first issues. And then we're going to... Um, do a brief review of some of the projects that the SMART Center is undertaking uh, to try to achieve that mission of integrating um, effective interventions at multiple levels of what schools call multi-tier systems of supports. Um, this has been the first and most important, perhaps, learning curve uh, of those of us who primarily spent their time doing research on community-based mental health is what are the frameworks and structures that schools actually have in place to support students, and what is the role of mental health and effective strategies and services for social emotional development of students across those levels. And then as we said, we're going to really focus then the second half on the brief intervention for school clinicians because it's a really exciting project and it provides um, a real opportunity for us to apply our um, experience with evidence-based practices to something that we think is really practical uh, for school mental health service delivery. So here's the context, looking at it from both sides of the equation, both uh, supporting young people's mental health as well as supporting the mission of schools. So if you look at it from the uh, side of, of um, the opportunity that schools provide for us to better meet the, meet the needs of, uh, of kids with mental health disorders, um, we know that most youth who require mental health services do not receive them. So the opportunity presented by schools is, is that this is where we can actually identify youth with these needs, 
And because they're kind of a captive audience, this is where we can provide services for those students. And that's why research shows that 70% or more of all mental health services take place in the school. And in fact, 20% of all students um, receive school mental health services annually. And this is something that we found um, in our school-based health center initiative that we've had uh, Elizabeth well before myself um, and others training the school mental health clinicians in Seattle's network of school mental, uh, school-based school health centers. Um, every high school and middle school has a designated uh, mental health clinician. And when we looked at the data, the administrative data from King County Public Health, we saw that half of all students just about availed themselves of school, school-based school health center services and about half of those students who did were getting support for a mental, emotional, or behavioral issue. So this is the uh, extraordinary need that we have to figure out how to meet. If you're talking about 20, 25 percent of all students seeking support and you have uh, one clinician in a school of 1,500 kids, that's your, ca your, your caseload is 1,500 students, right? So the opportunity is there, but the need is great as well. And one of the reasons that the need is so great is, is that although schools can improve service access for underserved youth and do things like facilitate improved academic performance and so forth, um, those who are working in schools um, have this extraordinary challenge of trying to figure out how to meet all the needs. Here's a little bit about showing how uh, school availability of school mental health can help close um, gaps in access that we see for minority uh, and underprivileged youth, which is that you see that um, uh, Caucasian um, youth may be just as equally likely to access uh, mental health services in uh, specialty uh, settings like community uh, health centers and private therapists. But when you start looking at the difference in percent of service access across these settings for African American and Latino youth, it's those youth who are predominantly receiving their mental health care if they receive any in school settings. So that's uh, speaking to this um, point down here about schools improving service access for underserved youth. So once again, just to kind of sum up the, the context here before we start talking about Smart Center activities, um, what we have to do to take advantage of this is to ensure that we're actually operating within the same kind of framework that schools operate within so that we can achieve the best fit possible of our mental health services within um, school-based support. So um, schools are increasingly conceiving of the supports that they provide for both academic and social emotional needs in these kinds of multi-tiered systems whereby they conceive of making sure that we have universal supports for all students, selected supports for at-risk students or those who are not succeeding with universal supports, and then targeted or intensive services for the few who need very intensive uh, uh, interventions or care coordination. With, um, uh, so this is kind of the continuum that we have to work within. Um, oops. Oh, did we get rid of our triangle in this version? Okay, we did. Well, that makes things simpler. Um, so we have evidence, so some of the examples of, of types of programs that are in these different tiers are uh, school-wide positive behavioral supports uh, at the universal level, screening and assessment of all students to make sure we're identifying the kids who might need uh, more intensive uh, services, and uh, social emotional um, uh, programs in classrooms as well as prevention uh, programs at the universal le level. Selected services may include targeted mental health services, uh, mentoring and so forth, and then targeted and intensive services may include behavior plans uh, and so forth. And so there's evidence that exists for the potential effects of school-based programs across all of these tiers, um, particularly with respect to tier one social emotional learning programs. Um, but with respect to school mental health, and here's where um, the, the Smart Center's mission really starts to uh, become clear, we don't know a whole lot about usual care school mental health services uh, including where they best would fit and how they would best connect to these different tiers of supports that schools and school systems conceive. But what we do know is, is that from a lot of studies, school mental health services are unlikely to be based on evidence for what works for specific pro uh, presenting problems. Um, and those evidence-based practices we do have in mental health have paid insufficient attention to how we could um, meaningfully integrate them into schools. Hence interns who are thrown into broom closets in, in middle schools in the middle of Vermont. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Aaron, I believe, to talk a little bit about how the Smart Center's mission is trying to uh, overcome some of those barriers, barriers to connectedness to the school context, barriers to using evidence-based practices, 
and uh, start giving you some examples. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think Eric set it up pretty well um, why we're doing the work that we're doing and the, sorts, the sort of impact that we're hoping to have um, in order to improve school-based behavioral health um, and to overall support both the emotional health and the academic success of kids when they're in school and when they're in other settings too. Um, we have these three interconnected arms, the way that we've conceptualized the center, the first being training, quality of evaluation, technical assistance, and, and advocacy. Um, and increasingly, we're working to become involved um, at the state level and elsewhere in order to um, really have an impact and try to be as useful as possible um, to all sorts of stakeholders related to school mental health. Um, also, assessment screening and data utilization. Um, these are concepts, as I'll talk about in a second, in the context of one particular project that are pretty central to where education is going and has gone. And I think there's also been a parallel movement within um, behavioral health services. And part of what we've been doing is trying to integrate those things. Uh, and then also research and evaluation. We are largely researchers and academics, and research is kind of what we do. And one way that we try to have an impact um, and to demonstrate um, that particular approaches may be, uh, may be effective, may be useful, and, and would be worthy of, uh, of scale up. So we have this general research and evaluation agenda that I'll run through, and then as we talk about particular projects, um, we'll try to link them to different pieces of this uh, research and evaluation agenda. The first is developing and implementing effective, evidence-based, and efficient assessment and intervention practices um, for schools and communities, and I think uh, that's pretty well represented by the BRISC project, um, which you'll hear a good amount about. Enhancing data collection and use capacity within a response to intervention or uh, multi-tiered systems of support framework. Expanding mental health and, educa um, and educational health service accessibility outcomes and efficiency. Um, which you could see could, uh, could flow from or be connected to some of those other uh, objectives. And then promoting linkages and integration among mental health, physical health, and educational achievement. Um, and sort of taking this larger whole child view of different kinds of services and different ways that they can be coordinated. Um, not just thinking about physical health, but also thinking about education as a sort of additional um, component of these models and, and ways that they can that, that uh, kids can be supported. And of course, getting back to Eric's original point, the flip side, how can, the, the flip side of how can mental health um, effectively work in schools, how can mental health effectively work for schools um, and support the mission of the school environment? So we have a number of different projects. I won't touch on all of them, um, but we've, we can organize them and have organized them along this multi-tiered model with the most intensive services falling at the top of the pyramid, um, and this including things like uh, high-risk coordinated care um, or wraparound services. Um, in On tier two, sort of the middle of the pyramid, we see school-based um, health center training and evaluation projects that we've worked on that deal a lot with uh, kids who may not demonstrate clinical levels of problems, although many do. Um, but uh, still need substantial um, mental or targeted mental health supports. And this is also where we've conceptualized the brief intervention for school clinicians, which you'll hear about. Um, and then down at the universal level, this bottom of the pyramid, has things like a new project, the Mender Collaborative, to, uh, to address disproportionality in student discipline, working on screening and evaluation projects, um, and thinking a lot about school-wide uh, positive behavioral supports. So I'm going to start talking about our specific projects by giving you a quick overview of a project focused on uh, the development and implementation of a measurement feedback system, which really hits this, uh, this second one um, of our, the second component of our research and evaluation agenda, enhancing data collection and use capacity within a R RTI or MTSS framework. Um, although through it, I think we're also working to expand um, health service accessibility and outcomes and promote these linkages between education and health. 
Um, this is a project that has been forged in strong partnership with our colleagues from Public Health of Seattle and King County and the different organizations um, that staff the school-based health centers uh, all around the city and beyond. So this project is really based on a number of premises, um, one of them being that if we really want to enhance um, the learnability and scalability and ultimate utility on a large scale of evidence-based practices, we may be better off thinking less about particular research uh, or particular um, treatment protocols in some, in some senses and focusing on kind of good enough sort of smaller touch methods of improving services and improving quality. And this has led us to think about disseminating and implementing key competencies sometimes instead of full treatment packages or in addition to full treatment packages in order to have as broad an impact as possible and to have um, a, a sort of a feasible quality improvement approach. And thinking that through this kind of simplified design of what it means to have an evidence-based practice, that you're enhancing the learnability the extent to which it can be sort of easily absorbed and incorporated into practice um, by practitioners working on the ground who are always having tons of things fly at them and always uh, need to navigate a lot of things in the moment and enhance the scalability of the practice ultimately. So this is really based on this notion of how assessment is not, and, and the importance of assessment and outcome monitoring is not unique to health services, um, but is also something that is becoming increasingly ingrained within education. Um, the response to intervention and multi-tiered systems of support are really based on this notion of data-driven decision making. So this project has, in, has involved adapting a measurement feedback system uh, for school clinicians, um, beginning with an existing system and taking it through a number of stages of iterative adaptation. Um, these kinds of technologies provide an infrastructure to, to uh, support both initial assessment and ongoing progress monitoring, often support communication among providers, sometimes providers of, of different types of backgrounds too. Um, and we selected, for a number of reasons, um, the mental health integrated tracking system, which has been used it originated locally and has been used um, far beyond that in order to support collaborative care models and progress monitoring in primary care for adults. Um, so this is just a snapshot of what the tool looks like generally. You see information about a particular caseload, um, indicators of progress or lack of progress, kind of the, the dashboard style information that a practitioner might need in order to prioritize who they're going to be uh, thinking about in the context of supervision or consultation, and also um, thinking about who they need to see more quickly um, and who might be at risk for deterioration. And our goal here throughout all of this was to avoid creating yet another measurement feedback system. We've actually done a comprehensive review of all the measurement feedback systems that are out there, and we found nearly 50 of them. And rather than creating a new one, it was sort of our goal with this project to identify one that could meet the needs of the school mental health context of the school-based health centers locally, um, rather than going through an elaborate process of designing a new system from the ground up. So that's what we've been doing. Um, Again, with strong partnership and leadership from our colleagues at Public Health, like Jessica Nasterwas, who's actually seen right here. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> uh, and we've been going through this iterative adaptation process that first involved focus groups evaluating elements of practitioner workflow and the usability of different um, feedback system components um, while we were getting feedback on the unadapted version of the system. We, we adapted the system after that in addition. Um, while also getting feedback from a year-long stakeholder committee funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then we ran the small pilot trial with clinicians who were randomized to either use the measurement feedback system or not following receipt of the exact same training in assessment and progress monitoring. And when we took a look at that, we found that the introduction of the system, of the adapted MHIT system, led to a significant um, and, and pretty noteworthy um, bump in the use of administration, the, the use of standardized assessment tools in practice, um, and that this was maintained even though we see, this, we modeled this linearly due to the small sample size, but even though you see um, a 
a bit of a decreasing trend apparent visually that's that's non significant and we see both these we see the uh, gains pretty much maintained uh, over time so we've certainly found that that's promising and we've been moving forward with a number of different pieces of this initiative including the incorporation of academic data into the system again to facilitate that um, that flow and that integration between health services and education, especially when the health services are present in an, in an educational setting. So now I'm going to pass it over to either Christy or Elizabeth to talk about BRISC. Um, so since about two, 2006, um, as Eric mentioned, there's been a relationship between the um, school-based mental health counselors in Seattle and uh, the UW SBH, um, the UW and uh, Seattle Children's Hospital um, in regards to a lot of training and consultation. This is done in collaboration with the um, Department of Public Health. And in this process, we have been able to obtain a lot of data and information in regards to the type of care um, and the type of needs that exist in the schools. One of the things that's unique about the school setting is that um, there's a lot more uh, changes within the context and there's a, a lot of environmental aspects. So, for example, there's um, large caseloads that Eric spoke about and there's a lot of disruptions in regards to just school scheduling. You have assemblies, you have testing, you have um, snow days, you have all kinds of things that disrupt the, the school schedule. Um, and these things can result in some difficulties with engagement. However, we also know that kids are in schools, and this is oftentimes where they're most likely to access services. One of the things we also obtained in our research is that, on average, kids seem to access, within a certain period of time, they seem to, to see a counselor three to four times. Of course, that's an average, so some might have receive more care over a period of time. But on average, they seem to access services about three or four times. Now, that could continue throughout the four years, so it doesn't mean three or four times throughout their entire high school career, but three or four times within um, a certain period of time, potentially addressing a certain need. So, um, And then the other thing is, related to um, the, the data that we found, is that oftentimes the kids in schools that are accessing those services may or may not have clinical um, diagnoses. In many cases they are subclinical and yet they are um, having problems with functioning and requiring some additional support and services. So um, the school-based mental health center provides those kinds of services where these some of those students may or may not receive that care um, outside, outside of there, outside of the school. So as we think about the triangle, which um, Eric showed earlier, we are really seeing BRISC as a tier two intervention. So tier one being the type of services that are available um, and accessible and used by all students, tier two being a little more targeted. So the way we see BRISC is that it begins as a tier two strategy. It is in many ways a stepped care model, the idea being they come in, we have this brief intervention and assessment, and then from there, students may get what they need, and they may come back down to tier one, or they may require some additional services about the same level that they're receiving. So they may have, they might be some students that need a little bit more than the three to four. Or in some cases, it might be that they need some additional services. Um, and the process that we are describing within the BRISC um, intervention really helps to assess what those needs might be. Um, and to be able to then figure out how to connect them to those resources, whether they are within the school or without of the, without, outside of the school. So we're thinking tier two, maybe one and a half sometimes, but right there in the middle. So there were sp some specific components that we were thinking about when we were thinking about putting BRISC together initially. So as we were thinking about the structure, we, um, we know that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that um, 
the effectiveness of problem solving and that as a skill and a tool. And so much of this, the brisk was designed around problem solving. Um, we also wanted it to be flexible because we know that kids in schools, one of the challenges um, of school-based mental health is that kids come in with all kinds of things from social issues, someone breaking up with a boyfriend or girlfriend to um, some really serious trauma and or some pretty severe um, uh, mental health issues. And so given all of that, we needed to have something that was fairly flexible and adaptable. So we thought about more of a modular approach that could kind of let it be adapted as needed. Uh, again, like I mentioned, a stepped care model, meaning in some cases it might require more care, and in some cases um, this might be enough. And we wanted something that was obviously engaging to the students, but I think there's two things when we think about engaging. Engaging in regards to having the student be interested and having some kind of a relationship, but also engaging in the process of treatment and helping the students to understand what it means to, um, to get help or to, or to see a counselor, that they can really be engaged in the process of it being helpful not just somewhere where they go and kind of just talk, but a place where they can go, they can talk to a trusted adult, but they can also gain some really um, important, valuable skills. And then lastly, um, specific treatment, target identification, connecting a lot with um, the work that we've done with the SBHCs in regards to um, standardized assessment and progress monitoring. Um, so we thought that that was a really important part to be included in the process. So here is kind of how we've... Um, what we've done over the last couple of years. So this has been a three-year grant. And it, the, the unique thing about this particular grant is it's funded through um, IES, which is Institution of Education, Educational Sciences. Institute of Education Sciences. Um, and so it's been a development grant. So the purpose of this funding has been to develop the intervention. So we've also done some obvious um, assessment and testing along the way, and we have, we're doing a brief, uh, a small trial this year, um, cause we want to make sure that what we're doing looks like it's going to be effective, but it's, but much of our data has informed the development. Um, so. Starting uh, with year one, we had a lot of pieces that were involved in it. We had um, sought experts from across the, the country as well as local experts in regards to school-based mental health um, care. And we started out by asking a lot of questions for what's missing, what, how can we, um, where, where, where can we fill in? Um, then there was a pre-pilot pre trial where we actually were able to go into the schools and start trying to deliver these services and getting a little bit more of a feel as the developers of the intervention what it was like to deliver these services in school. And then went in and did more of a full pilot. That happened in the first year. And I'm going to give you some of the results and where, where we went with all of these each year. Uh, the second year was a field test. So we had providers, um, school-based mental health providers. We had ones that were within... Um, that did the brisk treatment, and then we have had ones that just did treatment as usual. No, that's not true. We had them, they did all the treatment as usual at first, and then they were all trained on brisk, sorry. Um, this year, now we have some that are doing treatment as usual and some that are doing the brisk, um, the brisk protocol. So this is what we've learned. This is where we are. So in the first year, as we were developing uh, the protocol, there were several things particularly three different categories of things, of data that really informed the, the intervention. The first is we started out thinking very emotion focused. This actually shifted a little bit, bit over time, but some emotion focused, what the, what the student was reporting to be most problematic in the way they were feeling. Um, CBT informed, uh, so really kind of thinking about the cognitive behavioral um, triangle and the cognitive behavioral model. And then modular, that's where that flexibility piece comes in. And then brief something three to four sessions, as that's what the data was, was helping us to see seemed to be most consistent around how often students accessed it. Then we had our summit and expert informed. So one of the things that came out there um, is to remain small. There's a lot that you kind of can want to do and, and to take on, and it was the idea is to really stay tier, fo tier two focused, um, that there are other services that we oftentimes will be needed, but for the sake of risk that we're really staying tier two focused. Um, also really reminded us of the importance of academic targets uh, and really making sure that we are targeting academic um, goals and improvements as well and how that, that piece fits in. Um, and then 
including the measures to identify and track outcomes. Um, then, lastly, the school informed. This is what we really learned from our experiences going into the schools uh, and that during that first year as we were delivering the, the treatment. First of all, we realized that students didn't particularly come with identified emotions. They didn't always come in and say, I'm feeling sad. But they oftentimes came in more with an issue or a problem. Um, uh, they, they oftentimes, well, sorry, let me say that again. They oftentimes didn't come with anything particularly bothering them, but they were, but something was wrong. So oftentimes it took a little while, but in general we realized that there was more of a problem focus than an emotion focus. Um, the engagement and rapport required a little bit more time, but it also was really useful for informing the problem identification. So we realized that part of that assessment initially could also really inform that what we were doing in regards to helping the student come up with their identified problem. Because they didn't always walk in knowing exactly what it was they needed. And oftentimes they were referred from different people. They might have been referred through teachers, through their nurse practitioner, through the school nurse. Um, so there were many different ways that, that, that they ended up there. Um, but, we, but we needed to do a little bit more work in helping to them to identify a problem to address. We realized they also don't always come in and say, uh, they are depressed, anxious, angry, but they oftentimes would say they were stressed. The word that they used the most was stressed. I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. And so we thought that would be potentially a better marker to track. Now, if they use the word depressed, we can definitely go with that, but we found that stressed oftentimes was the, was the word that they referred to, so we ended up tracking stress. Um, and then it was, and then we realized we needed to be even more problem focused and we realized that next steps, I don't know that we had thought about that initially as far as where they would go beyond, beyond brisk. So in year two, this is where we had providers that did their treatment as usual and then they implemented the brisk. And we realized there was much more that we learned. First of all, we did learn that recruitment was possible. We were able to get students, um, and we were able to retain them. And we also learned that they, the students in BRISC reported higher levels of, their, of um, therapeutic alliance than actually students in treatment as usual. It was interesting because the counselors didn't always perceive it that way, but the students reported having a greater level of um, therapeutic alliance with the, the providers in BRISC. And then lastly, we got a lot of information that really helped to inform changes and adaptions we needed to make in regards to our training model, our consultation model, and our manual. Not so much heavy content related, they were minor content related, it was more about kind of honing things, but a lot more around helping providers and simplifying in regards to uh, making sure that they were delivering the pieces that were most useful. What we found is a lot of the providers were, provi were trying to do all of the components of all of the modules um, and not, this, not keeping it really focused. So that was something we realized within our training that we needed to improve. So, um, so as we think about the protocol, these are the four, this is where we are now. So this year, we have the, counsel the counselors are delivering brisk, and then we had an, a group that were doing treatment as usual. And so for the, br for the brisk protocol, this is, this is what we now have. It's been adapted, and so it's shifted a little bit over the last few years. But this is, this is what we have at this point. So first of all, session one is a lot about engagement and problem identification. Session two is problem solving. Session three, continued problem solving. And four is preparing for next steps. So we're going to talk about this a little more specifically. OK, so the beginning of session one is students will come in. And the first one of the first things we do is administer brief standardized assessment measures. This goes a lot of, along very well with the types of training that we'd already been doing with the school-based mental health counselors. So right off the bat, they complete um, the GAD, the GAD 7, and the PHQ 9. So it's, it's brief. They fill it out and then talk about it in regards to feedback. Um, then they assess current functioning. So this is a little bit different. So as opposed to doing a full assessment, which is oftentimes what we do as a clinician in kind of a community-based setting, this is much more functional. So we are looking at how are you functioning at school? How are you functioning with your friends? How are you functioning at home? How are things going for you on those areas? So it's, so it's an assessment looking at all of those areas. Now, while we're doing this assessment and while we're administering these measures, we are taking kind of note as to what types of problems the student may want to address. Sometimes, like I said, they may know what they want to work on. Sometimes they may not have it identified. But as we go through this process, we're able to kind of help to identify some of those areas that they find problematic. And so that leads to listing, identifying the problems. So once we've done this 
brief sort of assessment engagement. Then we ask them what what problems, what things are, are hard for them, what things they would like to address, what things they'd like to be different. And then together collaboratively create a list. Um, sometimes it might take a little bit a little bit more of the, well, what about this that you mentioned? And oftentimes students have several things that they that they are concerned about. But it's interesting because the, the way of engaging and assessing tends to lead to that a little bit better than doing a full um, a full assessment. It is, however, it's been really interesting. It is a little bit challenging to get the counselors away from that, that model of needing to ask all the questions and needing to have all of the information um, right away. So, um, so once they list the top three problems, once they list the problems, then they identify the ones that they think are the top three. Um, and in some cases, this actually we made optional because it was one of the pieces that sometimes there was too much time. Um, they may introduce the cognitive triangle here, they may not. Um, and then just talk about the possibility of working together for a few sessions. And then the, um, the last intervention that is used in this uh, uh, session is, informal it is introducing informal monitoring. The idea of paying attention to something. So one of the problems, one of the things that they de described as most problematic, have them focus in on that for the, next, for the next week or two until you see them again and really pay attention to it. Yeah. That is a great question, and it varies. So that's one of the challenges with schools is it depends. So in some cases, um, you get a kid for 20, 30 minutes, and sometimes you have them for 50 minutes to an hour. So it really varies. Yeah, which is why we really try to, and I think that's a lot of the honing down, that sometimes there might be a little more time to, say, bring in the cognitive triangle, and that might be relevant, and sometimes you just don't have enough time. So I would say on average 30 to 45 minutes, but probably closer around the 30, 35 um, and then, so with the in, uh, introducing the informal monitoring, this is just bringing their attention to something, um, whether they're tracking it on their phone, on a piece of paper, or just paying attention to it. One of the things that I think has been really interesting is as we have done these trainings and as we have had introduced clinicians to BRISC, the concern about whether or not they actually will do their homework. We don't call it homework. I think at this point we're calling them what are we calling them now? We've called them practice exercises, take away, try it at home. Anyway, we call them all kinds of different things so that because there's some kind of a connotation with homework. However, we've really found that in many cases they really will pay attention to it. They really will if we're really specific on what we want them to do and we're really clear on why we want them to do it. They actually are pretty inclined to, to try it and to do it. They may not always write it down, but they oftentimes will come back with some, with some really interesting data. So then as we go into session two, probably important to note that sometimes these sessions are not one week after another. These are schools. And so sometimes kids might be seen every other week. Sometimes it might be every week. So it really varies. Sometimes there might be a test that comes up. Their kid might be absent. So things definitely change. This isn't, that's one of the things we learned in the beginning is the, it's not particularly going to be one week after another. But we didn't see that that to be a problem. Um, as, it, as it sometimes spaced out a little bit more. Um, but we did realize we needed to have more flexibility. So coming back to session two, the first thing we do is review the informal monitoring and talk about what, what they discovered, um, and then recap the problem list and identify which problem they want to address. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes when they do the monitoring, they come back and they realize, yes, this really is a problem, or this is the aspect of it that's most problematic. But it also provides you with some really specific information to talk about in identifying the problem because part of the goal in this session is to simplify. It's not like it, sometimes the problem is really big, like I don't want to feel sad anymore. Okay, that, that's, re that's really big and so it just provides some more specificity in order to really figure out where we can target and where we can address. So then the other th piece that comes in in this session is to have them rate their stress. So they do a stress rating related to that specific problem that they identified. We've gone rounds about if they should do overall stress or specific stress, but we feel like if we want it to indicate change, then it needs to be related to what they're actually working on. So it's specific to the, the problem that they're addressing, so they rate their stress. And, and we talk about why and talk about how it's you know, going to be a little bit of a guide to see how what, we, what they do impacts how they feel. And then we introduce problem solving. And this is where we literally go through the steps. We have a, a sheet, a paper, literally go through the steps of how to do problem solving. So there's two things that are happening here. One is we are actually doing problem solving with them, but we're also teaching them the process of problem solving. 
um, and then helping them to come up with a plan to address. Uh, and one of the important parts of this is going through the barriers and really thinking through the potential barriers that are associated with their solution that they have decided that they want to implement and really kind of having them think forward about what things might help them to do it. So, oh, game plan for the week. That's what we're calling it now. So then they have their game plan for the week, which is what they're going to try that try during the week. Uh, and really, it's very, they usually come back having tried it. And, um, and when they don't try it, then we realize we've missed something. We either don't have the right problem, or we weren't clear enough, or it was too much too fast. So then they go away and they practice. So coming back to session three. Now, this is one of the sessions that we, that we definitely needed to do some refining in uh, for this last iteration. This is continued problem solving, but it's continued problem solving with the use of some additional skills that might be necessary. So if they're working on something like emotion regulation, they might have tried something that sort of worked for them sometime, but they might actually need some other skills. They might need some skills into how to communicate, how to regulate their emotions, how to talk to somebody, how to think about things. And so this provides the opportunity for a little more specific skill, skill training. We've kind of walked, got away from calling them modules, but it's kind of a module idea. So the idea here is, is that they do the, um, this becomes really individualized. So we do this in large part based upon how it went with their problem that they addressed and whether or not they were able to implement that effectively. So if they implemented it, matter of fact, I think I have. Oh, here's, here's our little diagram. So we were able to, so did the student successfully implement the step? Now successfully doesn't mean that they just tried it. Successfully means they tried it and it worked. It could be that they tried it and they did exactly what we talked about, but it wasn't, it, it didn't work. It didn't work for them to, it didn't work in the context that we were hoping it would. Um, and so did it, did it work? Were they able to implement it successfully or not? So if they were not, then we have to identify the barrier. And in many cases, it has to do with one of these. Um, so working on the wrong problem, they might feel like nothing works, they can't manage their stress, they're unable to express their needs, they're stuck in negative thinking. So we try to figure out what it is. And then from there, determine the guide that might be most useful or the skill or the tool that might be most useful for, to help them, them implement it. Okay? And then if they were able to successfully implement it, then it might be that they need more to work on. So it could have been like the first step in a larger problem, so then they can move on to the next one. Or it could be that this isn't the right problem, that somehow this isn't, that we didn't get it right, um, that that wasn't the actual issue, it was, it was something else. Um, and it also could be they're done. It has on occasion, I, I've, I've seen where the, the student kind of comes back that third time and they were like, wow, that kind of did it. I hadn't realized within the context of my um, disagreements with my mother that it was all based on a certain, maybe a certain aspect that once they were able to talk about it was then resolved. So in some cases they might be done. And the cool thing about that is they're leaving with a couple things. They're leaving with the skills, they're leaving with the idea of monitoring, they're e leaving with the idea of problem solving, and they're leaving with the idea that they can do something to make it better. And so if they need help in, a, in another time, they can see how this process can be helpful to them. Just the process of treatment in general. So, and then we move into session four. So this one, again, we've, so based on what they did in this session, there's more something that they're going to work on, that they're going to implement another level of the solution that could involve the use of skills or not, or it could just be an additional step of problem solving. And then they're going to come back in session four, and they're going to assess the outcome of the solution. So again, how did that go? And what, what ways might we want to um, target, tweak it, or change it in any way? And then they're going to ask for a stress rating. I don't know if I said that, but in session three, we're also asking for a stress rating. I don't know if I missed that. But we, also, we ask for the stress rating each time. And really, when we talk about it, we talk about it relative to the work that they did during the week. So if they've implemented the solution, like, oh, Look at this. You put your phone away, you know, at nine o'clock and didn't play on it all night and you actually fell asleep. And so whatever it was they were working on, we helped them to see how that would then implement, Im impact their stress. And then, oh, and then with this session, we once again administer the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 uh, and, and then talk about those outcomes and, and results. 
And then we really go through and review, review the progress. So we talk about the things that they've done and, and indicate the skills that they've used and the things that they've tried, and then talk about areas that they still would like to work on further. So it's kind of like a check-in. What's gone well? What have you done? And what, what still needs to be done? What's still really problematic? And in this process, then, it can help us to determine what the next steps are. And what we've learned is for the next steps, there seems to be um, one of four or five that, that seem to be most useful. So one is they come back if they need it. So they kind of got what they needed for now, and they go, and they can come back when they need it. Um, the next one is an ongoing school-based counseling. So this might be the kid that it's working, and this is the level of service they need, but they need a little bit more. There might be a few more problems that they need to address that they need support in doing that. It could be that they need a referral to an outside services. They need an outside therapist um, on some occasions, particularly with some really intense trauma, where we've definitely had to help them to get into those services. The cool thing is, what Briscoe allowed, allows them to do is it allows them to see that this process of therapy can be helpful. And so even if, obviously, with a really severe trauma, for example, we couldn't even begin to address what needs to in four sessions, we have seen situations where we've been able to engage the student in the process in a way that they're actually more willing to access those services. Um, and then the last one is regular check-ins. Now, we thought about this as we're thinking about working into the school setting. There's a lot of people in the schools that these kids have connections with. And sometimes what we've noticed is the kid comes back each week mostly just to report in on like how awesome they're doing on using the tools that we talked about or they got their work in. And sometimes they just need somebody to be able to tell those things to. And maybe that's the school-based mental health counselor, but maybe it can be somebody else. Maybe it can be a teacher or a coach or even their school counselor or someone else. So really kind of determining who is the best person for that to play that role. Um, which, which, like I said, if we're trying to increase access to the school-based mental health counselor, it may or may not be that person. Um, but really creating that connection to be able to, um, to be able to make that check-in. So it's not just like sending them out, but it's literally creating and helping them to identify that person and set that up. So one of the things that was interesting as we did the training, especially a, the, a lot of changes that led from second, the second year to the third year, is the counselors were saying, oh, it's not enough time, or someone was saying it was too much time. And the idea is really that this is trying to get as much as we possibly can in a shorter period of time. What we know is that kids accessing school-based services may access them once, and they may or may not come back again. And so we want to make sure that that first session isn't just a long assessment where we now have a whole lot of information about them. But we are trying to give them something and trying to help them to work towards something each time we see them and really making the most out of that time. So, yes. I was just going to say that, you know, regarding these next steps, this really is, um, as Christy was just uh, referencing, kind of part and parcel of our attempt to ensure that the mental health intervention, quote unquote, or strategy that we're building is well connected to the context of school-based mental health delivery. And to facilitate that even further, one of the things we've tried to do is to um, think about what would accompany any training that you give a clinician in the school on this uh, strategy or intervention in terms of how do you build a resource guide or an ability to better, as, as best as possible, connect them to the context of this particular school. And some of the things that we have discussed as a team is, is that if this was to be taken to scale, there would be some supports to uh, BRISC being implemented in the school along with the taking stock of what, who are the community-based and school-based providers that might be available for um, either um, referring to more intensive or specialized services or within the school, if this counselor-student um, relationship is not getting needs met, or if it's time for just checking in, what are some of the options within this specific school? So trying to facilitate as good of that connection that we talked about at the beginning as possible is also part of the effort. OK, so I think this is kind of exciting. So these are our very, very, very early findings. It's still really small, um, but given even the fact that we have a really small sample, so we've just started looking at some of the data that has come in so far this year. Um, again, it's small, so we're not making any conclusions here, but it's looking promising. So what we have, what we have seen is as we've gone through the data and we look at 
our, the, the kids that have done brisk compared to the treatment as usual, so this is kind of our, our, the brisk that we have um, this year's brisk, that we're finding that the students have reported in actually really significant, statistically significant ways that they are finding it helpful, that it's meeting their needs. So they said that the kids in brisk felt like it met their needs more so than the treatment as usual. And again, we're just talking about the first four sessions. So one of the things that we're thinking is not that the other services aren't as helpful, but what we're trying to do is try to do it a little bit faster. So could it be that there's just something about trying to jump in and get it done in four sessions versus what might take a little bit longer, um, kind of trying to get to know each other and doing a lot of the assessment and a lot of those pieces. So we're finding that um, it looks like they report that it meets their needs. Um, reducing impairment. So when we're looking at our impairment scale, they tend to report um, less impairment at the end of risk as opposed to treatment as usual. And uh, they also, the other uh, indicator that stood out is their interpersonal relationships, which actually we thought was kind of cool because that is one of the, the modules. I don't know if I mentioned our modules, I should say that. So our modules are our guides that we're really addressing our emotion regulation, um, interper communication related to interpersonal relationships, and uh, realistic thinking, where we really kind of thinking about the cognitive triangle. Um, and then we have some, some strategies that we've also included in regards to motivation, but I think that part's still, we're still working on what, what the, how that fits in. Um, but that was kind of exciting that it really did pick up the interpersonal relationships as one of the indicators. Um, and then reducing symptoms of depression and anxiety by um, using the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 results that, that we have had early on. So here's just a little bit of a that it does appear to be reducing um, the number of students in the clinical range based on, on BRISC, which is kind of ex exciting. Yes. So, yeah, so w this was, yeah, starting at the beginning and then gathering the data about eight weeks out. Yeah. It's for, it's, it's really designed for any kids. So the idea is that kids accessing, we do know that a lot of kids that are subclinical access school day services. So we wanted to come up with something that could kind of address both those needs as well as higher needs. And so if, in some cases for kids that are clinical, it might be enough or it might not. It might be just the intro and then refer to the higher level of services. So it's really designed to be able to, regardless of whether it's clinical or subclinical, to be able to help them to identify some aspect that they, or something, some kind of a problem that they can do something about, and then kind of putting a plan in place and helping them see the impact of that. So I think I'm turning it back over to someone. Elizabeth has been you know, was really this was initiated with Elizabeth's uh, history of working with uh, the clinicians in our school health centers. Is there anything you wanted to add, Elizabeth, about the odyssey that is our federally funded BRISC project? Not really. I think uh, I don't have anything I really want to add other than uh, schools are where it's at. It's really fun to be in the high schools, and uh, we're looking forward to expanding to middle schools and schools in other areas. And I think also one of the things we've learned along the way with BRISC is, is that, you know, our partner, one of our partners, the school, uh, the Seattle schools, um, the chief operations officer or uh, assistant superintendent, associate superintendent for operations, Peggy McAvoy, keeps encouraging us that it's time for you to start talking to our school counselors because there are counselors in any given school that actually take on these kinds of tasks in addition to all the, you know, uh, college recommendations and course scheduling and so forth. And how wonderful would it be for, to have a tool like this to efficiently intervene that's explicitly talking about referring as soon as it's obvious that the student might need help elsewhere. But for those students who might be, you know, half or so who could benefit from a brief inter structured intervention, you've got a tool in your toolkit to do that. School nurses, another option. And we've been working with a national expert on trying to get school nurses to be more effective mental health supports in schools about how BRISC might be adapted to school nurses. Um, so, uh, Aaron, you want to talk about next steps? Maybe pause for a second. We have a little under 10 minutes. Who here works in schools? Any school clinicians come? What, is, what do you think of this? I'm just going to put you on the spot. The one person who came willing to raise their hands. Anything, anything, here, anything here resonate with you? You're making me regret raising my hand. Um, I, I like that, the concept of it. Um, I think there's a lot of probably pragmatic issues um, and diversity in each school community that 
you know, that are popping up in my mind as far as how it would work. Um, as a therapist, I feel like it's a little bit like my role would be a, a colander and just sifting through people. And I don't know that I would enjoy that personally. Um, but I, I think it definitely fits um, in, in your comment about um, teaching school counselors, I think would be really effective because one of the barriers as an outside agency in the school is consenting and, and getting kids enrolled. And that can sometimes be a two-week process. And putting that before these four sessions would be like detrimental to that kid. Um, but if a school counselor who already has maybe a relationship or doesn't have to do that paperwork can do this and then refer them to us or to somebody and, and get those services that they need and filter it, uh, it would probably be more beneficial. So I definitely think that would be a, a great way to go. Yes. Yeah. So those are very, thank you so much. I really appreciate your willing to be put on the spot that way. But I think these are the kinds of things that our team talks about all the time, given our experiences with folks like yourselves as well as the clinicians who are in the schools. So, uh, just to respond to that, I think it's a, it's the exact comment that um, the school-based mental health folks have given us that kind of feedback. And I, I think there's... We started out thinking of it as a brief intervention, and I just want to be really clear that we've kind of iterated to the point of thinking it, of it as a way for school-based clinicians of probably different stripes to do a triage, and certainly knowing that they're going to keep, people like yourself are going to keep a bunch of these kids where you do a long, longer term or um, individualized intensive intervention, but if Schools are trying to serve this kind of flood of kids initially. You've got to figure out a way. How do you figure out who can I serve? Who do I need to quickly get to something more? Um, who can I serve in a briefer kind of a problem-oriented way? So we aren't trying to think of it as an alternative to really working more intensely with some kids. We talked a lot about um, a really interesting and very possible research project would be to ask for which roles is this most appropriate? Um, indigenous folks in schools like nurses or counselors, folks from community agencies working in schools, which is a very common model for providing mental health in schools, or embedded school clinicians, such as those who are full-time within the school-based health centers. Those are just a few examples of the types of folks who are in schools that help students' social-emotional needs. What versions of this would be most appropriate for all of those roles is kind of something we all talk about over beers a lot. Um, so just really quick, um, we have a number of other uh, projects within the SMART Center. Um, once upon a time, as we were launching the SMART Center, we would um, take um, field trips to Seattle Public Schools, Highline Public Schools, Issaquah, and so forth, and talk about this new center and say, our aspiration is to be a method through which, you know, you can work with researchers to uh, evaluate programs, to do research that might be relevant to how well you uh, do this kind of work in your districts and so forth. And the good news, the really cool news, is, is within a year or two, we now have about four federal grants that represent these kind of partnerships, um, including another one with IES around reducing disproportionality and discipline in Seattle schools, which if you read the paper is a huge issue. Um, we have one that Aaron and uh, Clay Cook are the PIs on from the National Institute of Justice to develop an early warning indicator system for students at risk of dropout and intervene stealthily, and I look forward to learning more about exactly what that means, uh, to address their academic and behavioral risk needs. I'm really, really interested in learning more about this. Um, and I uh, talked about uh, the Minority Engagement and Discipline Reduction Project, which if there's ever a, a kind of indicator of a good partnership with a school district, the uh, Assistant Superintendent herself came up with the acronym, so we know we must be doing something right in terms of academic school partnerships or maybe something wrong that we're making them talk in even more researchy acronyms. Um, but uh, that's our spiel. We've got a few more minutes for questions or, or comments or thoughts. Dr. Kearns, that's okay. Someone has to step in or I'll have to like start plucking people out of the audience again. I'm saving you all, actually, from being plucked out of the audience. No. Um, I love the public health implications of what you're trying to do and kind of right-sizing people into the interventions, um, giving them what they need, not more, kind of trying to, to do some of that. And, I mean, it struck me, and I know this is sort of related to the other question I asked about kind of the, look, you know, people aren't meeting the clinical diagnoses, which I think is really promising. You want to get kids before they're failing out or blowing up or that kind of thing. And... But I'm wondering about kind of sustainability and like how, where do you see something like this living after your grant funding is over 
when you have kids that maybe aren't aren't rising to the top of everyone's awareness of their mental health needs and you have a resource that is, you know, fairly significant, it sounds like, needed to kind of meet their needs, which I, I think is fabulous. But I'm wondering, like, what, what do you see as sort of the, how it would live on? I'm going to defer maybe to those who are there kind of at the initiation of this whole idea, like Elizabeth. Uh, well, one of the things that we have found is that... Um, Many of the folks in the schools, and I'm kind of looking to maybe a next phase as we move to the school counselors and the school nurses, um, are, are eager for um, skills and tools that allow them to do some of this work and are very hesitant to do it uh, without a little bit more support and training. Um, and so I think our ultimate goal would be that to be able to train those people to do it such that it would be something that they would carry on independently, you know, incorporate into their practice. Um, that's certainly been our goal with the school-based mental health folks, but um, that's kind of a fairly sophisticated tier of people. Um, and I think we've made some good headway in terms of incorporating some of these approaches within their practice. But I think it's really uh, to... to get enough evidence to be able to sell it as a useful tool for people to learn how to use and use in their everyday school work. Um, we have been, uh, you know, I think that this whole process, I'll just say one more thing, um, this whole process, I th and Jessica can comment, um, you know, we partnered in a grant 10 years ago to begin to engage with the school-based mental health folks, and that was a two-year grant. And because people liked that, it was a positive interaction. We have continued on um, now, you know, a decade later, we're continuing on. Some of those years, we didn't have very much funding at all, but the agencies, because the care providers liked the interventions or the work that we were doing, uh, public health, you pay to public health, um, but the agencies also kicked in enough for us to continue this, and then now we've, it, that, those monies have expanded, so. Another thing to note is, is that whereas a lot of interventions will require week-long trainings, you know, at least once upon a time we were doing this in a day with follow-on consultation. So there may very well be, you know, some core concepts that can be taught and maybe booster sessioned in relatively efficient ways that actually stick. But that's going to be part of our ongoing research, I think, is to find out more about that. So I guess we are at time. And uh, anything else from... The UW PBHJP folks, our hosts, if not, thank you very much for coming and listening.